Welcome to the Therapy for Black Girls podcast, a weekly conversation about mental health, personal development, and all the small decisions we can make to become the best possible versions of ourselves. I'm your host, Dr. Joy Harden Bradford, a licensed psychologist in Atlanta, Georgia. For more information or to find a therapist in your area, visit our website at therapyforblackgirls.com. While I hope you love listening to and learning from the podcast, it is not meant to be a substitute for a relationship with a licensed mental health professional. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for joining me for session 103 of the Therapy for Black Girls podcast. In today's episode, we'll be chatting with Dr. Magdala Sherry about how you can partner with your primary care physician for better health outcomes. But first, a quick word about our sponsor. This week's episode is sponsored by Naturalicious. Naturalicious is the world's first vegan, high-performance hair care line that delivers the results of 12 products in only three. It's designed to reduce time spent on hair care and is proven to save up to 80% of time on wash day. Naturalicious was founded by innovator Gwen Jameer, who is the first and only African-American woman to hold a patent on a natural hair care product. These products are great specifically for busy women with curly and coily hair, also known as 4C hair, and they are all natural. They are sulfate, paraben, mineral oil, petroleum, gluten, and cruelty-free. I've been using the products on my hair for the past two months, and I am officially sold. I'm currently rocking a week-old twist out that is everything. I actually shared a picture of it yesterday on Instagram, so you can go to my page at Hello Dr. Joy and see it in action. The products have really been a game changer for me. They leave my hair detangled after washing, shiny, and super moisturized. The first step in the process is a Moroccan Rasool 5-in-1 clay treatment That is your shampoo, conditioner, deep conditioner, and detangler all in one. Step two is a moisturizing cream you can use to style your hair. And step three is the Divine Shine Moisture Lock and Frizz Fighter. These products all work beautifully together and take far less time for me to do my hair than any process I've ever used before. They're a complete lifesaver. So if you want to cut down on the amount of products you use and get some time back in your busy schedule, then I highly recommend you try them. You can find the Naturalicious products in over 1,200 Sally stores nationwide, or you can buy them online at naturalicious.net. And just for y'all, because I know many of you are itching to try them, we have a 10% off promo code so you can go ahead and get your life together with these products. Use the promo code at naturalicious.net and enter the code JOY at checkout to get 10% off. Now let's get back to our episode. For this conversation, I was joined by Dr. Magdala Sherry, who is a board-certified internal medicine physician, motivational speaker, and health policy enthusiast. Dr. Sherry currently practices as a primary care general internist and assistant professor at Rowan Medicine in New Jersey, serving the South Jersey and greater Philadelphia community. Her career focuses include women's health, lifestyle behavioral coaching for chronic diseases, and addressing health disparities in vulnerable populations. Dr. Sherry and I discussed how primary care physicians are involved in screening for mental health concerns, how they collaborate and refer to mental health professionals, how you can better advocate for yourself with physicians, and she shared her thoughts on what PCPs need to do to ensure better health outcomes for Black women. If you hear anything while listening that resonates with you, please share with us on social media using the hashtag TBG in session. Here's our conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Sherry. Thank you. I'm excited. I'm very happy to have you here. As therapists, we typically do lots of collaborations with, you know, primary care physicians and other health professionals, all in the name of making sure that we're treating our clients well. So I'm very happy to have you here to hear from the physician side about like what that collaboration looks like and what kinds of things are happening in your offices to make sure that we are helping our clients tend to their mental health. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So can you tell me about some of the things that you may have in place in your practice or that may be kind of commonplace for physicians in terms of helping to screen them for any mental health concerns? What is typically done in the primary care office, you know, when you're coming in for your annual exam or getting your check-in is what we will call per our preventative guidelines, which a lot of times we use the U.S. Preventative Task Force to kind of tell us, hey, what should we be checking for? And that's in regards to, you know, your typical things like hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol. But we also have some guidelines when it comes to mental health. One of the big ones being depression. It is advised that we do screen everyone, in particular women who are pregnant, do screen our questions, which we call the PHQ-2, which ends up falling over if that's positive to the PHQ-9. And this is important because I think sometimes when patients come in and we ask these questions, they get a little apprehensive. Like, why do you want to know that? So the first two questions we typically ask is, have you lost interest in doing things, the things that you love and, and things like that? Or have you felt depressed? lonely of that sort. And if you don't have a good relationship with your doctor, you may quickly say no, or you may overlook and say, yeah, everything's been fine. But that's what we need to start screening and say, hey, could this person in front of me have something else or have some underlying major depressive disorder or something going on? So I really wanted to bring that up. So when patients hear something along those lines that the doctor's asking them, that they should try to answer as you know honestly as possible. Now, for people who already have a diagnosis of depression, so let's just say you established with me, you came in, you already told me, and you're actually on treatment, the big thing for us is we monitor you along the way. Because we recognize that a lot of times when the mental health side, whatever you're going through is ignored, that can actually spill into your clinical health. So your blood pressure might not be controlled. You know, your diabetes is not where we want it to be, or you're gaining weight and you're heading towards obesity. So a lot of times it's back and forth. You may come in for something medically related or a symptom. And after we ask more questions, we have to take a step back and say, hmm, Are we missing something? Is something else going on that's complicating the picture? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Dr. Sherry, because I am curious about like what kinds of things a client might say that may make you think, oh, this may have more of a mental health slant than a physical slant. Because I think especially for Black women, sometimes the symptoms will present physically before they will recognize that it is actually a mental health kind of a thing. So what kinds of things might they say that would tip you off that this may actually be like a mental health issue? Great question. So one thing is the person who's coming in for frequent visits and, you know, you've done the work of a common, some of the common complaints you get is abdominal pain. That is a huge somatic complaint, how we call it, something that's physical, that tends to be sometimes a lot of psychosocials involved. And you do the full workup for the abdominal pain, you've gotten blood work, you've gotten imaging testing, and everything's negative. But this person's coming in like, I still have it. Another good big one is headaches. Headaches tend to be a big one that people come in for. And, you know, you make sure they're not dehydrated and, you know, make sure their blood pressure is okay. But as you work up everything, that's not going away. And then the timing of the symptoms too. Too. So sometimes people will have symptoms only at particular times. It's always when they're going home or always when they're going to work. So you kind of, as you're asking more questions and getting more details to make sure you're not missing something medical, you start to kind of get the antennas go up. And then another big one is fatigue. So really it can present as anything, but it's really as we ask more questions and we start to see a pattern or we see a person that's frequently coming in to see us and they're not really satisfied with any medical answer or they're saying they've tried it per se and it's not improving, that we start to say, you know what? Let's take a step back. Let's find out about more what's going on at home, who they're living with, what's the dynamic, what's happening at work. That's a big one that I get. And you find out people are, you know, either they've, on the bridge of being laid off or their pay cut has been decreased or other factors, lots of stress at work. And you're like, ah, now it's starting to make sense. Yeah. And I think it's encouraging to hear you say that you kind of spend this kind of time with your patients to ask these questions. But I'm also aware that lots of people, you know, one of the frequent complaints you hear about like your primary care doctor is like, oh, they don't spend any time with me or, uh, you know, they don't ask a whole bunch of questions. So in what kinds of ways can primary care doctors maybe do a better job of being more thoughtful in asking these kinds of questions? Because it sounds like you spend a lot of time like getting this background information. Yes. So this is 
true. And I get the same complaints very often. I do believe that patients and people in general need to be very proactive about the doctor they choose. So, and what I mean by proactive, you know, if you feel like you're going to talk better with a woman, then your doctor should be a woman right? If you think that you'll have a better connection, especially for people of color, to have a doctor who's a person of color, then you should actually seek that. You should ask friends and family to say, hey, what doctor do you go to? How do you feel about them? You know, I'm looking to establish care. I know the barrier will be insurance and cost or even distance, but I think just like we're proactive about everything in life, I think that's the first step. So I work at an academic institution, so I have a lot of medical students and residents who will follow me And a lot of times I send them in the room first to go see a patient and then they'll come back like, yeah, she wasn't really talking to me or she wasn't really giving me much information. And I was like, okay, maybe something else going on. And then I'll go into the room and before they even open their mouth, I'm like, "Mm -mm, something's up, what's happening here? And we'll end up talking and then I'll get more information. And every time my resident or my medical student says, how did you do that? Like, how did you figure that out? And I said, because we have a rapport. So that first visit, when they come in and establish care with me, you know, I spend a little bit more time digging into their history and their background, or just as time has gone on and I've seen them several times, I've seen them in happy moments and low moments, and I really push them to tell me what's happening in their life. So even before I even utter a word, when I walk in, you can pick up that dynamic. And a lot of times it's what doctors do. We may not say anything, but we're watching you. The posture, how you're talking to us, is anything different from before? So I think this is really hard to do in primary care these days because what people don't know is that we're looked at, you know, in regards to productivity, how many people we can see, you know, how much time we spend. So yeah, this is very difficult, but I think if you can bridge the barrier and getting a doctor you feel comfortable with, that you've been proactive about seeking, and then tell them up front. I had one woman say to me, so yeah, I'm establishing here because I wasn't really happy with my last doctor and I want a doctor who's going to partner with me. And I paused and I asked, I was like, ooh, okay, explain that to me. And she said, I want to make sure I'm heard and I want to make sure that we have a rapport so I feel comfortable with telling you what's going on in my life because I understand that that can play a part in how my health looks. So again, it took me listening because I really had to stop typing and, and that's the hard part too in primary care because you're sitting there typing at a computer and I had to say, wait, wait, what does that mean? What are you looking for? So that could be something too when people are going in and they're seeing patients or doctors are there to say, you know what, what are you looking for? You're coming to see me, you're establishing care or you haven't been here in a while. Where do I work with you to get to where we need to be together? And so, you know, when you're doing all of this groundwork as a great primary care doctor, I think the tendency can be then, of course, for your patients to want to come to you for everything, right? Mm -hmm. And so even if they have a hunch that it is more of a mental health of concern, Mm -hmm. because they feel comfortable with you, you are likely going to be the first person that they go to. Um, So can you tell me a little bit about the process? Because I do know that some primary care doctors feel comfortable like prescribing, you know, for prescribing medication for something like anxiety, depression or something else. So can you tell me a little bit about what that process might be like? Like how comfortable typically are primary care doctors like managing mental health issues? Oh, great question. So for our training, things like depression, anxiety, that's probably the big ones that we typically do. Or when we're talking about anxiety, not just generalized anxiety, but, you know, temporary anxiety or work stress and things like that, we are able to manage, whether that's through counseling in our office or adding medication. The problem is the time, right? So a lot of times what I find is the big issue is you've gone through all the chronic care stuff, the hypertension stuff, the diabetes stuff, the annual visit, making sure you got all your vaccines, all that good stuff. And literally right about the time you're about to turn the doorknob and say, hey, I'll see you in six months, the patient will say, oh yeah, and work has really been killing me and I really feel like I'm anxious. So it's almost an afterthought. And that's sometimes what makes it very difficult for the primary care doctor to spend that time. So what I always encourage patients to do is if you think this is related to your mental health, can you make that appointment? Say that. So say, you know, I'm, I've been really anxious, just like you would say, I have abdominal pain. I kind of feel it's important to empower patients to say, hey, I don't like my mood. I don't feel comfortable or make that very clear when you're making the appointment or even as you see, you know, the MA or the nurse who comes in before the doctor does. So I think that's huge. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, when we're talking about the primary care doctor, yes, a lot of times they come to us because they're comfortable. But we also have to assess, is this person stable? So do I have time to say, you know what, I'm going to start you on meds because that takes a few weeks to start? Or do I say, you know what, I need help now? And that help could look like crisis, 
you know, right on the phone, right in the office, or it could look like I send you right directly to the ED, to the hospital and let them know you're coming. Or it can mean, you know what, while I'm in my office, if I can, I look for resources and try to get you into a therapist's office as soon as possible. So for us, our primary thing is let's just make sure this person's not a harm to themselves and a harm to others. And do we have to intervene at that point to make sure you know, they're cared for. And then, you know, based on that, we look at, okay, is this related to job? Do they have to take time off? Which is a big thing that, you know, your primary care doctor can help you with, but saying, you know what, I need some time off because I really can't get a handle on how I'm feeling or my mental disease. And even just to have time to, you know, go see a therapist consistently. So, you know, there's many ways that we're triaging and trying to figure out what does this person in front of me need? But the big thing is I got to make sure you're safe. And once I make sure you're safe, I say, okay, so what can I do at this point before I plug you into other services that may be necessary for you? Got it. And I appreciate you sharing that, Dr. Sherry, because I think sometimes people don't necessarily have the language for what's going on with them, right? Like they just know something is off. You know, my mood feels kind of funky or whatever. But even if you say that on the phone, then your primary care doctor then knows to like ask more questions about that. So you don't have to know exactly what's happening, but if you can kind of give them a heads up that something's going on, then they can kind of ask questions to get at the right direction. Yes, exactly. And even if you don't come in just saying that and leaving a message for the doctor, a lot of offices also have um, online portals now where you can communicate with the doctor electronically. So maybe you feel more comfortable, like, you know, you're still in the process of articulating your feelings, right? Because we know there's so much taboo around saying, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I need help in that regard. So maybe you send a message to the doctor and say, you know, I don't like how I've been feeling. And the doctor can even just call you make sure everything is good and that this is not something that warrants you going to the emergency room, but then can also make that appointment for you. And maybe they know that you're very, you know, nervous about sharing that they can make their own dialogue in the, in the visit saying, you know, give me a little bit more time with this person. It's a little personal. They're going to need. So you've already said, Dr. Sherry, that sometimes you will make the assessment like, okay, this maybe feels like a case that is more than I can manage. Maybe I need to make a referral to a therapist or a psychiatrist or someone else. Can you tell us what that then collaboration process looks like between like yourself and the therapist when you have a patient who is seeing both of you? Great question. And to be honest, I don't think this is done as well as it should be because a lot of the big hurdles that I face in my practice is knowing what therapist is covered under someone's insurance. So a lot of times in the office, I don't really have that answer. So I'm giving them resources more so to find someone and then making them follow up. So just I can have a checks and balances like, hey, you know, it's been four weeks. Did you talk to anybody? Did you call anybody? But to say that there's like direct collaboration where I can say, hey, Dr. Joy, you're seeing one of my patients, you know, can you tell me what you think? I can't honestly say that I do that often. So I will say sometimes with a psychiatrist, but there's a lot of confidentiality there. If I'm really concerned about the patient not really adhering to their medications, but they're telling me they're seeing a psychiatrist and the counseling that's associated with the office, there's a special records release that a lot of offices will have that, you know, talks about how sensitive that information is and asking the patient to allow me to be able to view that. And I have a few patients that I've done that for, especially when I'm really concerned, like, "Mm, is she really taking on her meds? She's telling me, she's reporting this to me, but I'm not really certain because the way, you know, some some of the symptoms are really in between for me and I really can't gauge. So that's when I was stepping there. In regards to, you know, connecting with a therapist, a lot of times what I mainly do is say, you know, have you seen someone, you know, is it covered by insurance? I do like to make sure financially that's an okay issue for them because it really would be horrible for someone to plug in with someone and have a good rapport, but then can't afford it. And a lot of times, you know, once someone tries a therapist, if it doesn't go well for whatever reason, it shuts them down from trying to go again. Mm -hmm. So that's why I kind of like to make sure, are you comfortable? Can you afford it? Have you guys talked about a plan? Because I want to make sure that I encourage them and give them some affirmations in the room as to, yes, it may not be the best one right now, but hey, let's try again because this is really going to help you. So asking those questions. And sometimes I say, you know, do you want me to reach out to them? You know, I might not be able to get much information, but would you like me to? Most times patients are feeling pretty good once they get a few sessions in, but they don't feel like they need me to talk to them. And I can already see, like, you know, now they're back on track with their health. They're eating right. They just have a better mood in the office. And that in itself is good for me to know. And I usually just ask, you know, how frequently are you seeing them and and things like that. 
Yeah, and I do know that some therapists will get the release from the client and then send the primary care doctor like maybe a little write up every month just saying like, oh, they've been keeping their appointments. This is what we've been working on, you know, just so that the primary care doctor is kept in the loop about what's happening. Yeah, yes, definitely. Yeah. Are there ways that you can think of that maybe both primary care doctors and therapists could do a better job of like making sure that we are kind of working as a treatment team in the best interest of the client? I think there needs to be more collaboration. A lot of times, you know, the person that you see for primary care is at a completely different institution. And a lot of times, you know, the therapist they may be seeing maybe private, doesn't necessarily work with a healthcare organization. So, I mean, that's a great question. I think that's something that needs to be explored. You know, do we have, you know, local sessions where, you know, we invite primary care doctors in the community and therapists in the community to kind of collaborate together. You know, if you are working with a healthcare organization that does have the therapist right there, I know a lot of institutions, they have like care coordination meetings. So at least, you know, everybody's, all the players are in the room, which is ideally would be the great way to go for primary care in general and just how we approach you know, each individual patient in front of us. But this is something that still needs to be worked on. I know for me, I don't really have like a direct connection with a therapist where I can say, hey, let's meet up and see, you know, if we can chat a little bit about what's going on with a few of my clients. Because really, honestly, my patients are, they're scattered as far as who they're seeing. So it makes it really difficult to kind of keep that collaboration and direct communication going. Got you. Yeah. And I do also know that lots of therapists will try and come and meet with like maybe the nursing staff. You know, I know primary care doctors, your schedule is really busy, but sometimes they can meet with like the office manager or whatever to kind of introduce themselves so that then there's a better idea of like who's in the community so that when you need a referral for a therapist, you have some ideas about who you can send your people to. Yeah, that like, honestly, if, I don't think we've had anyone in our office, we get that a lot with nursing services, services in the community where they'll come by and drop a pamphlet and kind of give information. So then when you need someone who needs help at home, you're like, oh, yeah, I remember this person dropped by. So I think that actually would be a great idea if a lot more therapists could like, you know, make maybe a one page pamphlet or a brochure about what they do, their expertise, and kind of drop it at the office, kind of just get some face to face. And that'll help the collaboration too. And it also helps too with certain websites like Therapy for Black Girls, where you can actually read a profile. Or another one I love is Psychology Today as well too. That's kind of what I pull up in the office, to kind of get a little background and share with patients. Mm hmm. So, Dr. Sherry, I know that you are involved in training, and of course, there has been lots of media coverage, lots of stories, and all of these things coming out about Black women in particular in our relationships with our physicians, and how, you know, sometimes Black women are not believed, or the doctors will think that they have a higher pain tolerance than they do, that they're med-seeking, like all of these things. And so, I would love to hear you talk about, like, what kinds of things you're doing in training your future physicians to kind of make sure that we are, you know, teaching them to be more culturally responsive. Oh, absolutely. So I'll share one initiative I've done. So basically what we're talking about here, what you've mentioned is talking about, you know, there's not equity in regards to how we view patients and how we're treating them, right? Especially when we're talking about the Black woman. So in particular, so part of my role is not only being a primary care doctor, but I'm also an assistant professor at Rowan School of Osteopathic Medicine. So I might on the same campus, and because of that, I get a lot of trainees. So one way I've kind of helped to start tackling this topic is by introducing a health equity module within one of my courses. So traditionally, it's started to shift, but traditionally what would happen is we would learn all the medicine, right? All the hard stuff, the cancers, the, the chronic diseases and how to treat them. And our focus was so much on that. But we're realizing now, you know, if we're really going to tackle the conversation on healthcare, we have to start talking about social determinants of health, how people live, work, and everything around them and how that plays a part in their care. And as much as we know that's a factor, we're not translating that in medical education. So what happened would be, you know, you get a one week course or maybe in your family medicine rotation, you would be trained on like, hey, yeah, don't forget about the fact that gun violence is important or trauma is important or things like that. But no one makes that connection, makes that correlation. And it's always done in isolation. So with my course, what I decided to do is as you're learning the medicine, there would be different module readings and videos that I would 
ask students to read and as part of their grade to really get them to say, you know what, there's a social component to this too. It's not just black or white. A lot of patience exists in the gray. And a lot of times it takes a little bit more effort on our side to really understand the community we're working in and the people we're serving. So different readings on racism in medicine and what that looks like, the pain bias we have for people of color versus people who are, you know, not, not colored, things such as why other components of diet and other cultures impact diabetes or how someone's job or what they're doing plays a huge part into how their health translates. So just different health disparities amongst different groups and what could be the cause of that, not just, hey, they don't like to go to the doctor, they don't like to be screened, but there's more to it. You know, there's also been a historical you know, background as to why there's a lack of trust among minority communities towards physicians. Do we understand that? So part of introducing that and being involved in that in curriculum really allows students to understand how they're advocates and understand how it's more than just diagnose and treat them with medication. And have you found that as a whole, like medical education is moving towards including more of this in the curriculum? Yes, absolutely. And a lot of it, too, was is because of students. A lot of students, especially around the time when, you know, police brutality was becoming a huge thing and was really, you know, in the forefront in the news. And I don't know if you're familiar, but there was a... Um, a die-in that was staged by medical students across the, the country where it was a uh, white coat for black lives and students in their white coats would be in a large area atrium and be on, you know, on the ground in their white coats protesting and standing up for how, you know, racism and police brutality is a public health issue. So it really got uh, all the way up to the training boards and the governing bodies that kind of o- oversee curriculum and how things are, are carried out in medical schools where they're like, Whoa, you know, Students are asking for more education on this. Students want to be more involved, especially when it comes to social injustices, especially when it comes to addressing disparities among groups. So we kind of had no choice but to say, "Uh uh-oh, we got to do something about it. So there's a lot of curriculum at different schools that's popping up and being able to start to address this. But then what happens to the people who, like myself, have already graduated, I'm done with residency, I'm in training. What if I don't feel comfortable with this? And I think that is where we really have to start to tackle it because, you know, our patients in the community are seeing these doctors. So we have to make sure it's not just the people who are coming up, but how do we address and educate the people who are already out there? Right. And I know for lots of therapists, um, you know, we, of course, have licenses in our states as well. And for a lot of states, one of the continuing education credits you have to get is around multiculturalism and diversity or something related to that. Mm -hmm. Is there the same kind of requirement for physicians? Yes. And a lot of that will be in the CME trainings or different conferences you'll go to where you'll get the credits for maintaining your licensure. You'll definitely get that. But I mean, even part of that, I feel like we have to challenge it a bit more because how many times have you heard the word diversity? (laughs) How many times have you heard the word cultural competency? And quite frankly, some people are out there and they can't even recognize their own bias. Right. I mean, hence why we see what's happening to black women, too. Right. So. Yes, it's out there. It's The terms are there, right? We throw it around, but are we truly dissecting what that means and really sitting back and saying, hmm, are we getting this right or not? Because we've been throwing the, these words around for quite some time. These aren't new, but are we doing it the right way? Right, right. So what tips do you have, Dr. Sherry, for our listeners? You know, you've already kind of shared a little bit about how you feel like patients can be stronger advocates for themselves. Do you have other tips related to how our listeners can maybe do a better job partnering with their primary care physicians? Absolutely. And if we're talking directly um, in regards to the audience, especially when we're talking about therapy for Black girls, when we're talking about Black women, one of my favorite phrases when I have a woman of color in front of me she's talking about everything and you know I can hear her speaking like I think I have this but it's probably because I work too hard or kind of minimizing her symptoms I will pause and I will say to her can you please take your superwoman cape off and leave it at the door and a lot of times they end up looking at me and I'm like yes you don't need to be superwoman in here and I think that complex which we were very familiar of it's been talked about in literature I'm you know a lot of people are aware we don't realize that we carry that into the doctor's visit and it's in there. And part of, I think, the conversation that needs to happen, especially when we're talking about, you know, what's happening with Black women, especially when it comes to healthcare, is also talking to Black women and saying, hey, you know what? Don't bring the superwoman complex and actually make the time to advocate for yourself. So some things I tell people is don't multitask. Like, 
when it comes to your doctor's visit. So people will just be in the office like, oh, I have to hurry up because I have to pick up the kids. You know, I have to go make dinner. I have to do X, Y, Z. So when you're there, you're not really there. When you're there, you're planning for the next few hours. So pick a time to see your doctor when you have a break. You know, if you can, you have a babysitter. If you can, you can plan it when you're on vacation and the kids will be at school. Like just be intentional about how you approach it. At, at times, yes, it's going to be difficult because maybe it's an emergency visit, something's acutely going on. But still, value the time you have so you can really be there and be present and say, you know what, Doc, I have these concerns. As much as, yes, stress plays a huge part into our health, do not say, oh, I have abdominal pain. But I think it's stress. Because a lot of times, too, what I find is you'll present a complaint to the doctor but you'll suppress it by almost adding your own commentary. Oh, it's probably nothing. I'm probably working too hard. You know, it's probably, it's part of being a wife. Oh, the chest pain's there, but you know what? I just, you know, I don't have time for myself. And you almost coast, like, coat right over it. And if you keep doing that, at some point, the person who's sitting across from you and taking notes will also start to do the same thing because you started to just minimize it and you don't put the urgency there too. So I think, especially when it comes to Black women, don't minimize your needs. If it's a huge problem, you say that, Doc, I've been having this chest pain. I really want to talk about it because I'm really worried about it. And that will bring my attention up. So I think, again, leaving the complex, making the time for it, and really don't suppress what you're going through. And if you don't like an answer, you know what? Find another doctor who's actually going to listen to you and advocate for yourself. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, Dr. Sherry, because I think there can sometimes be like this whole difficulty challenging authority, right? And when you think about authority, you know, a doctor in a white coat, that kind of comes to mind. And so, you know, hearing that it's okay to like ask for a second opinion or to kind of push back on if your doctor says something that you don't quite agree with, like that it's okay to challenge them. And ask them to explain. One of the things I always say to people is if the doctor's ordering a test, you know, whether that be blood work or an imaging test, you say, hey, doc, what are we doing this for? Like, what is this? What are we doing it for? What are we looking for? So, you know, if it looks like X or if it's positive per se, what would be the next step? What are we concerned about? If it's negative, what have we ruled out? What does that, you know, put us at ease for? So, yeah, we should be encouraged and in the dialogue. And if you don't understand and we've used big words, because trust me, I'm guilty of it too, say, I don't understand what you mean. Can you explain that again? And don't be afraid and just say yes or nod your head. Really ask the questions. I love those tips. So where can we find you, Dr. Sherry? Where can we find you online as well as any social media handles that you want to share? No problem. So online, I have my own website. It's www.drmagdalaferry.com. And you can see different things that I'm doing and even connect with me there. I also do have a Facebook page, which is under Dr. M. Sherry. And I'm also on Instagram. So people often send me messages on Instagram. It's at Dr. Magdala Sherry. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Sherry. All of that information will be included in the show notes for people to find. Thanks so much for chatting with us today. Thank you. I'm so thankful Dr. Sherry was able to share her expertise with us today. To find out more information about her and her practice, visit the show notes at therapyforblackgirls.com slash session 103. And don't forget to show some support for our sponsor for this episode, Naturalicious. It's the world's first vegan, high-performance hair care line that delivers the results of 12 products in only three. You can find the products in over 1,200 Sally stores nationwide, and you can also get 10% off your purchase online by going to naturalicious.net and using the promo code JOY, J-O-Y, at checkout. Remember that if you're searching for a therapist in your area, check out our therapist directory at therapyforblackgirls.com directory. And be sure to visit our online store at therapyforblackgirls.com shop where you can find our guided affirmation, breakup journal, and your Therapy for Black Girls t-shirts and mugs. Thank y'all so much for joining me again this week. I look forward to continuing this conversation with you all real soon. Take good care.